the first trick I ever published was actually not a trick. It was the Einstein shuffle. So it was a utility move. I believe it was in Genie Magazine, April 2001. Uh, I met Richard Kaufman at the very first Magic Live convention. And at that point, I was showing them the shuffle around. And there was a little bit of a competition between Magic and Genie Magazine. I ended up going with Richard. And uh, yeah, so that was the first thing I published. And then shortly thereafter, I also filmed the VHS tape with Magic Smith. Uh, so I did the Einstein Shuffle on VHS, which was digital. Now is a digital download. Uh, of course, I've refilmed that and I have it uh, released kind of to my own stuff now. Um, so yeah, so the first thing I published was in a magazine. I've published a few things in Magic Magazine since then. Uh, but most of what I've done has been self-produced. So it's mostly been my own DVDs and lecture notes and, and um and so forth. So I haven't done a lot of publishing in magazines or other other publications. Uh, well, both are I came up with differently. Uh, Einstein shuffle, you know, is a utility move that uh, something that many magicians want to be able to do to be able to shuffle the cards in a very convincing way, but not actually change anything, right? Uh, and uh, I grew up playing cards with my family, uh, my grandparents and my grandparents' house mostly, and we played all sorts of card games. And when we shuffled, we would normally cut the cards, we would overhand shuffle, and we would do a shuffle with a bridge. Uh, and, you know, we always played on hard surfaces, not soft close-up pads. So you would rarely do the type of shuffles you'd see in a casino on the table. You'd almost always shuffle in your hands and bridge. And so that's uh, something I always kind of wanted to be able to do once I got into magic and started playing around with ideas to how to make that happen. And of course, I already knew the push through shuffle and the zero shuffle, and it was a modification of the zero shuffle. So at some point I had the idea of springing the cards instead of just pushing them underneath that cover card. Uh, and it looked really bad and I didn't think it was gonna work, but I kept trying and eventually it looked better and better. And finally, you know, it looks like it does today. So uh, it was just a lot of, uh, you know, a vision for some, something that could be, uh, you kind of see like that's a possibility and then you just keep trying until you get it right. But it definitely took time. You know, it probably took me a lot longer to come up with it and create it than most people will take to learn it because I didn't really know exactly what I was going after, you know. Um, so that's the Einstein shuffle. Einstein's dream, I think, is the other one you asked about. And uh, Einstein's dream um, was very heavily influenced by Brent Braun's Torch to Restored. I met Brent in the early 2000s at an IBM National Magic Convention uh, in Orlando. And he had a little pamphlet that he was doing. He was showing me the Torch to Restored. And at some point I came back and I uh, started playing around with that and playing around with some different versions of it because his version was basically only the flash restoration from, a, you know, he burned the card to do that. Uh, and so I took that idea and I started playing around with other ideas. And at some point a friend of mine gave me the suggestion of using a repositionable glue instead of double stick tape. And then that opened up the doors to be able to experiment and come up with all the different variations. So what, I, what I love about Einstein's dream is that you can do it in the hands version, you can do it in the spectator's hands, you can do it piece by piece, you can do it in a flash. So there's lots of different variations about how you can do it all from the same setup and it's really clean. It's, uh, it was really a great version of the Torn and Restore card. Uh, most of my creativity comes from uh, fixing uh, things that I see that I think need to be fixed in current routines or current ideas. And so, uh, you know, there's, I think, different paths to creativity. Some people have epiphanies that they come up with ideas and, and then pursue them. Uh, for me, that happens on occasion, but for the most part, it's doing a routine or playing with a move or an idea and realizing it doesn't work as perfect as it could for whatever I'm using it for. And then either modifying the move or modifying the routine to make it work uh, better for what I am envisioning. So most of my creativity comes from that sort of thing. It starts off as a very simple change. And, and many of the things I've created in my mind were just what they were previously without realizing I had made all these little changes that actually made it quite a bit different and, and was fooling other magicians that were in the know at that point. So uh, lots of little changes over time is generally how I've created stuff, but there's exceptions. It's, it's kind of a little bit of both. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, again, it's going to be different for every person and every personality and every performer. 
uh, I think the more you can be knowledgeable about a variety of things within your field and out of your field, the more you connect those ideas. So one of the easiest ways to create things is you're connecting multiple ideas that are kind of separate and you're making them into new ideas by bringing them together. Uh, another way, of course, is like I just said, said is fixing problems. So solutions to little things that you see wrong that maybe other people don't see wrong, or maybe that other people are happy with being that perfect, but you you want to make it better and you have an idea come up with ideas of how to do that. So it's just a lot of curiosity. It's a lot of figuring out how to uh, always ask questions about how you can make things better. Uh, and and also, you know, always looking for new and different ways of doing things and not being satisfied. I mean, there's many routines that I've come up with or moves that I've come up with that I thought was like the pinnacle and like the greatest thing ever. And then someone else comes up with a better version of it that I have to go, yeah, that's better, right? So it, there's everything's kind of, um, you know, not stopping too, whether it's at someone else's routine or even your own routines is also, I think, an important thing to keep going better and better and better. Sure. Um, so I was never really into Rubik's Cubes much when I was, as a kid. I think I had one at some point and, and you know, tried it and never could solve it. <laughs> um i saw i think the first person i saw really do a rubik's cube magic trick was daryl uh, and then i got to see garrett thomas's version of daryl's routine uh which is actually based upon craig nichols going back to the 1980s uh, routine uh it's called the enchanted cube and garrett thomas had some amazing work on the enchanted cube and uh i saw him at um i believe it was the first lvmi or second lvmi close-up magic coming in vegas and it was a really he was doing some really awesome stuff with it then uh, and it wasn't until years later that a friend of mine, John George, put out a DVD, uh, the official Ruby's Cube, How to Solve the Cube with Tyson Mao, uh, that a friend of mine and I, uh, that was not a magician, bought at Barnes and Nobles here in the United States. And we were basically both together challenged each other to learn the cube. And we together learned the cube in a day on how to solve it. And then um, I don't recommend anybody doing this, but then I had a very long drive home from uh, this uh, friend of mine who lived hours and hours and hours away from me and you know on the highway I practice finished so I kept basically repeating the moves on, on my drive home uh, so that's how I was able to solve the cube and it was a few months later that I then you know started playing with ideas for the magic side of it and you know uh, what a lot of people don't realize is a lot of the history of Rubik's Cube magic almost all the ideas and things from shells to uh, moves and presentations matching and one side solves and all these things all have their origins in that early 1980s. Uh, the big difference that and most people had lost that knowledge because it was really a very limited time that people were doing Rubik's Cube magic. Not only that, most people also don't know that it was a very limited time that people were doing Rubik's Cubes. The first Rubik's Cube competition was around 1983 or four or somewhere in that, or I think 82 maybe. And the next one wasn't like 2002. There's about a 20 year difference between Rubik's Cube competitions. And what really brought it back was two things. One, the internet, people being able to share ideas and just like in magic, how that's changed magic and the creativity of ideas and, and younger people in particular. Uh, same thing happened with Rubik's Cubes where people are able to challenge themselves a lot more. And the other thing is advances in Rubik's Cubes so that, that the original cubes in the 1980s were really hard and very square and you couldn't do much with them. And so a lot of what you see today with a lot of the moves, you uh, you couldn't really do back in the 80s or the 90s. It wasn't until the 2000s that you could start doing one-handed moves very smoothly and more importantly, silently to be able to do magic stuff. So at that point in time, around 2008 or so, when I started playing with it, you know, the cubes were definitely better, but not many people were into them other than a very small niche group. Uh, and so, you know, other than Garrett Thomas, there's very few people other than myself that started playing with, you know, doing magic with Rubik's Cubes. And I think I was one of the first, if not the first, to really come up with some ideas with um, a normal Rubik's Cube. So there's very few people, again, doing stuff with actual normal Rubik's Cubes to be able to do a quick solve, false shuffles, uh, and then construct the routines. And, um, and one of the early ideas I had was, uh, was based upon something Troy Huser showed me, actually. Uh, not with Rubik's Cubes, but with um, the trick where you drop the big ring on the rope and it links. But he did it instead of out in the open. Uh, I forget who actually created that trick originally, but he, he did it in, in like a box that was really cool because I remember you couldn't see the moment that the, link, the ring linked to the rope and it somehow made it more magical. Uh, even though it was less visual, it was actually to me, I could just feel it was more magical. And so initially I played around with ideas that since Takamitsu Sui has played around with of solving the cube in the bag, 
I, I didn't ever quite found something I really liked with that, but it ended up leading to the switch that I created, which I think has had a lot of utilities I fooled a lot of magicians with and has opened the doors to do lots of routines from quick solves to uh, matching effects. And, and then you also now you can incorporate even gimmicks in with that same switch, uh, which is done right out in the open and on the offbeat. It's just super deceiving for anybody that's not familiar with it. Yeah, so uh, I, at some point I put out a DVD with John George, who uh, whose DVD I normally or initially watched, and we included that as a part of a three DVD package called Cube Effects. And so I, I put a lot of my early work on Cube Magic on that. Uh, since I've also published something called Foundations of Cube Magic, which goes a lot more into very simple ball shuffles and ideas, I think, I think are really a great foundation if you're doing magic with normal Rubik's cubes. But uh, on that uh, DVD, we went over uh, lots of ideas. Uh, and one of them, you know, some of them you had to actually be able to solve the cube, at least part of the cube, which is pretty easy to do the first two steps. Most people can do the first two steps pretty easily. Uh, so we had like a really awesome one side solve that you had to be able to solve it. But everything else, you, you, all you had to really learn was the moves to get into that sequence and the moves to get out of that sequence. The problem is if you mess that up, which is not hard to do when you're new with the Rubik's Cube, then you have to either take a cube apart or learn how to solve it. So I always recommend people learn how to solve the cube, but for a lot of the routines out there, you don't necessarily have to be able to solve the cube. It's only, it's, but it's a great out if you mess up in the middle of a performance to be able to, you just switch in the middle of performance and do an actual solve if you can do it in under a minute uh, and then proceed with the routine as normal. So it's, it's really a useful thing to be able to do as an out for any routine you're doing, even something that's with gimmick, a lot of the gimmick cubes out there now. Connected was a uh, online lecture. It was one of the very first online lectures I think released about doing magic on Zoom type of performances. Uh, Josh and Andy had the idea of, you know, uh, basically releasing material that would be appropriate for magicians to do in this type of new virtual format that's interactive, uh, but all, it could be either interactive or not interactive. It could be more visual or interactive mostly. And so they really wanted magic uh, and magicians to be able to publish material that was interactive. So the first one that released was Danny D. Ortiz, and he had, uh, you know, just applied a lot of his previous routines that worked really well for that type of medium. Uh, but most of Danny's stuff I saw that from watching it was a lot of it was really one-on-one -on -one type of performances versus performing for a bigger group and really getting a lot of people in, interacting all at the same time. And so Josh and Andy approached me and asked me if I had ideas on this topic. And so I um, took a lot of the existing routines I had. Uh, I was doing Zoom shows at the time. And so, but some of those routines I was doing are routines either that I didn't want to release or that I couldn't release because they were based on someone else's idea that I didn't have permission to publish or whatever it was. So I had to, of course, come up with ideas that I, one, I could publish and two, I thought were really good for that medium. And uh, since I was doing Zoom shows at the time, rather than just doing the six tricks, which is what they had asked for, I thought it'd be a better idea to maybe put them together in the course of a show. So the show that was released wasn't really my show per se, all the elements of that are in my show. Uh, I put those six routines together in the way I thought would be most appropriate for having a 30 minute show. Uh, and I was pretty happy with how it turned out for the very beginning of the pandemic and uh, with not a lot of material out there at that point in time. I thought there's some really great ideas about how to use the medium, how to use Zoom, uh, how to really interact without even interacting. So how you make everybody that's at home not interacting feel like they are interacting, even, uh, even if they're not actually the person on the screen. So uh, I was pretty happy with how that, and of course I've taken a lot of those ideas and incorporated them into my show since then. Uh, I have done, you know, quite a few Zoom shows and online shows uh, over the past year. I'm not doing a lot right now. It's not something I've ever, I haven't put a lot of focus into marketing. My business uh, for laymen, you know, outside of the magic industry, which is most of my businesses for laymen, has always been word of mouth. So, uh, you know, you get a good amount of word of mouth business from doing one show and then another show but I haven't actually actively marketed a lot. And, uh, and where I live in Florida, a lot of live work is also coming back. So it's been kind of a mix of uh, both uh, at this point, so yeah. I don't think anybody really knows what the future holds. I think there's lots of things that could happen in the future. 
but I think, you know, with the way things are currently going, yeah, I think the online shows will be around for quite a long time. I think they're all, I think it's a new market that's been created. That's not going away. Uh, I don't think that's going to, I think live shows are going to come back and it's going to be, you know, opportunities for both. It's just, and then I think there's also going to be some sort of hybrids between the two, um, which I've to some degree already seen because, you know, when you start doing live shows, especially nowadays where people can't, if you're doing a, a private event, it has to be very small by the nature of like being able to gather small groups together and people can't really travel very easily to it. They, instead of when you're at that live event, you're going to be performing and then people are going to be zooming in or FaceTiming in or whatever it is. So there's, there's also going to be this weird hybrid thing where you want people that are across the world watching your live show still to actually be able to participate too. So I think, and I think there's gonna be all kinds of variations of hybrids like that at corporate events and other things as well, where it's gonna be a live audience and a virtual audience. And I think, you know, that's gonna be a slightly different thing as well. So I, th I think it's just gonna be, I, th I think it's great because for me, I've always been a type of entertainer that doesn't do one thing. I've done everything from kids shows to trade shows to close up to stand up to the teaching for magicians, right? I like that variety in performance and it just gives you one more way of being able to perform for people in a different format. It's not something I'd ever want to do exclusively, just like I wouldn't want to do any of the other things exclusively. Uh, but it's something I think it's a great thing to add to the arsenal and, and make you a better performer overall and give you more opportunities to work and perform. Be better. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's simply that it's it's never being satisfied with what you're currently doing and recognizing that you're not the greatest and no one is the greatest and that you can always be better you can always work on things and the hardest part i think for most magicians and people in all sorts of industries is being able to have a realistic expectations of how you are perceived outside of how you perceive yourself and the more you can be aware of how your audience actually perceives you and not just one person in the audience, but individuals within your audience, because whether it's a close up or a stand up, you're gonna have people that are enjoying their experience and there's other people that can be enjoying it more or less than that person. And especially when you're performing in close up, you have the ability to see like those facial expressions, reading their body language and being aware of how people are actually reacting to you and not just focusing on what you wanna see, but on the things of like, you know, how do I make this other person that's not engaged for, maybe no reason of your own. Maybe they just had a family member die. Maybe they're just not in the magic or they used to date a magician that, that screwed them over. Who knows? It could be any reason why they're not into the magic, but how, how can you become better at performing? How can you be better at your magic being so strong that person has to react no matter what? And I think that has always been what's kind of driven me is that you, know, you have to recognize and have confidence in yourself that you're doing a good job as long as you are and being realistic about that. But you also have to constantly be saying, well, what can I do just a little bit better to get a little bit better reaction, to make people feel a little bit more emotionally connected, to make people feel a little bit more amazed by what I'm doing. And I think if you're always doing that, if you're paying attention and also working on yourself as well as paying attention to the outside, I think you are you can't help but over time be better. It's only when you stop doing that that you become stagnant. And uh, and the other tip I'll give in that is that you will become stagnant and you will go through phases probably where it's, you become stagnant and you get better and I do the same. Uh, but it's always a matter of recognizing that you're in those phases and get out of them. And again, try to improve and to evolve into something that's better. <laughs>